podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Welcome to the Cardiff Central Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Cardiff Central Podcast. Uh, joining me as ever is Carwin Harris. I am, of course, Harley. But first of all, how are you doing, Carwin? Yeah, not too bad. Introducing you before yourself, Harley. What's, what's that about? Am I am I now more more important than you? Well, you know, you're the you're the one who does like actual sport journalism and stuff. It's a, a more respectable opinion than me, who's just a bloke who get who get who drinks and uh, drinks and spouts opinions. I don't I don't think I've got any opinions worthwhile talking about. To be honest, I I, I, I waffle on and uh, I was literally criticised for waffling the other day. So that just says a lot about me as a so called sports journal. But then. Your opinion seems to be a lot more concise and to the point. I don't know. Maybe that's just maybe that's just the scientific background of me uh, being being told you know to try and use less words. Maybe we should start with that as a stick that straight on socials. Be like, who's 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 a, who gives better opinions? <laughs> Harley or Karen? Just stick it as a mouth and just divide all our listeners. I say divide all of this. Is what happens if it's hundred percent towards you, and I'll just be sat there on my top, just be like, "Okay, this is great." <laughs> then I'll tell my mum to to uh, be nice on some of the burner accounts. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So just just a quick, just the usual reminder and plug that we are available on all good podcasts and apps, but also on YouTube. When you, if you want to see our wonderful faces and the uh, decor of my mum's spare room. So um yeah we're I getting was, up to close to 200 gonna... likes just just to forewarn that if we do if the YouTube channel gets up to 200 likes Lee has threatened to post a video of him dancing to Beyonce so I don't know if that's going to cause people to unsubscribe or not but if we get to 250 we'll take the video down <laughs> Yeah I I I want to ask about the artwork in the background that you've got there because it does it looks like an upside down Two people kissing, one of them's upside down. Yeah, yeah. So Which, it's the sort of wire mesh thing. It's, it's again, it, as in, it, and if, because of the work situation I'm in at the moment, I'm, I'm currently crashing at my mum's during the week. Then, yeah, so this is yeah, sort of thing. It's part of her B room. So actually, over here, you've got like all B themed stuff, which you can't see. It's like a homage to um, Spider Man in a sort of in a more artistic way. I mean, yeah, because it's like a Spider Man homage, and then it almost looks like Spider Webs, which is uh, excellent. <laughs> You can tell we really do want to talk about rugby tonight. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I've already segued three times, haven't I? <laughs> so, so before we before we go on to that, so how was your weekend? Yeah, Did you get well, into anything interesting? Um, last weekend, no, I was quite quiet to be honest. Um, not working on the games as it was in in Ireland. Um, so it was nice to just chill, watch the games at home. Um, yeah, not not as uh, lazy as it was two weeks ago, but the. It was sitting watching the games and uh, enjoying pretty decent, well, two decent games and then a bit of a <laughs> shambolic game between Italy and France. Like, it's still got to work out what all, all that was about. But then uh, a nice games night in the evening, which I was uh, positively grumpy about from the night before, I think. So, yeah, not a bad weekend. What about you? So, yeah, I managed to watch the first half of the Wales uh, Wales Island game live then i uh, drove drove up to bath so missed the second half and then promote pretty much all of the england scotland game caught the last like 10 15 minutes in uh weather spoons in bath because uh, i went to go see al murray and that was brilliant class so yeah uh, i won't i won't uh, broadcast most of his routine for the listeners if you if you are interested go i thoroughly recommend going and watch watch it watch it for yourselves um so move, move, out of interest sorry this is i and we're not advertising our murray but i'm purely interested now that we got on the subject is he still doing the pub landlord routine or is it now a bit more a bit different he's he's still the the pub landlord character but i mean it's you know because that's what people want so, you know he does spend 80 percent, 89 percent of the time berating the people in the front row or if you <laughs> have the temerity to come in late <laughs> But uh, yeah, and then you know, some of the, you know, few, few, few very well placed comments about uh, the the past few leaders of the Tory Party and uh, stopping small boats. To which he argued, if you're that worried about all the people coming in on small boats, why didn't you stop the big ones first? <laughs> oh dear. 
Yeah. Very well. So, um... <laughs> We, we anyway, won't go down uh, yeah, so too many moving swiftly, moving, moving <laughs> swiftly on. So we do we we don't have much, but we do have a little bit of uh, Cardiff news. So obviously we last week we um we signed uh, Stefan Emmanuel from from Bath when he finishes his thing in Millfield. In a similar vein, we've now signed the very um, highly rated Tom Bowen, who's uh, this is a back three player. Apparently, he's played a fair bit of centre as well, which again is where we're quite light at the moment. And in typical in typical Welsh rugby fashion, we signed these two players and they're immediately called up for Wales duty. <laughs> <laughs> of course, in, in this instance, it's uh, the under eight, the under eighteens for the um, Six Nations Challenge or under eighteen challenge or whatever crap they're doing. So um, so let's join him. And I believe Stefan Emmanuel has been named captain as well. So uh, good for him. But so they join Sean Davis, Joseph Jones. Tom Howe for the main Wales and Dory teams. And then you've also got Dylan Barrett, Lloyd Lucas, Oshin Darwin Lewis, double Baron Amy, that's he's not going to do very well. Ollie Das, Ben Roberts, and Johan Perry for the under 18s development, which is gonna be a which I didn't realise we had an, a separate under 18s team. All right, yeah. So first of all, good signing. I mean, yeah, uh, you know, and congratulations yeah. to the boys. Yeah, it was, it's that clip that's uh, gone 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 around the houses a bit again of Tom Bowen that you know Steph that he puts on uh, put, playing for one of the Cardiff age grade teams and he you know skins one player skins another and then a bit of a goosey in there so you know that sort of footwork reminds me a bit of Matthew Morgan to be honest um, so I was excited to see excited to see him come come back and it was it's good news obviously he's had had a bit of time at Clifton isn't it Clifton College and um, Bristol involved in that setup so. Um, nice to get the players coming back, and you know, there's all this talk of players going outside of Wales to to earn their in in their corn, but also to 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 finish their development in these colleges. So it's nice to see them coming back to Wales, and uh, and 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 well, let's be honest about it. For them now, it's a really good opportunity. As before, you know, they were probably thinking, oh, okay, there's more opportunities in England, perhaps because there's more teams. Now it's if you're in Wales, you're likely to be part of a 15 it, by the time you're 20. You know, you're likely to be capped by a region by the time you're 20 by now. So, um, yeah, it's, it's it's good news for, for for Cardiff and good news for Wales in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I think as well, because people forget, like, leading up to um to COVID and everything, they were the Cardiff were actively looking to do deals with the likes of um, Hartbury and Clifton and uh, Millfield and saying, well, we'll support you and if you sort of, you know, and you can go play for them, you can go do those things. But if you sign, if you keep signed with us as an, in the academy and then you, you go away and then you come back and we'll keep, we'll have a place for you. So it does feel like that's starting to work because obviously they might, they probably, the trends are these two, if this, you know, they're still in the 18s, they're probably not going to be quite ready for pro rugby just yet. So they're mm. both, you know, still very young lads. Oh, yeah. But the fact that, you know, they've gone, they've experienced this wonderful rugby, you know, rugby environment had their um you know had that education and now they're coming back and they're bringing that back to Wales I think that's you know probably a bit better than maybe say letting them go to Jersey and coming back um much more than you know you could have just signed them on as a academy lad themselves straight away yeah, no, dig, you know. no digs at any of the uh, our fellow uh, Welsh regional teams yeah um, um you know I, I simplified it a bit by saying you know you, you're going to get Appearances by twenty, but you are more likely. And you know, you looked at you look at the likes of Delarue, Mackenzie Martin, Morgan Morse at the Ospreys. Obviously, these are still these are young lads coming through and making a huge impression. So you know, if the if the track record's there, they're going to take it and and I mean, and go for it. And if they're good enough, they're old enough, and all that, those sort of adages as well. Yep, Abs- absolutely. Um, yeah. So just so you know, so the Wales under eighteen. Games as part of this Six Nations challenge thing, um, they're going to be taking place at Astrug Munich, with the development side play kicking off at half twelve, followed by the main under, which seems a bit mean to call it the uh, the main under eighteen Wales under eighteen anyway, into the lift net at two thirty. Um, I don't know about ticket prices or anything like that. I imagine if yeah, it might be you know a couple of quid in a bucket on the door, but so the next next bit of news is another coach signing. Or, you know, at least someone moving from part-time to full-time. Do you want to take us through that, Cowan? 
Yes, the announcement that I think we all knew was coming and we're excited to hear that it was coming, which is that Mellon, Gethin Jenkins, has signed a permanent contract. He's gone from being part-time, which, you know, by various reports was at one stage two or three times a week and then became uh, being paid two or three for two or three days a week, but actually working more than that apparently as well, fair play to him, but um, also meant that sometimes he messed away games. So to, to have him on a permanent deal is great for Cardiff. Obviously, it offers continuity. You know, we spoke a couple of weeks about um, the situation at the Dragons and, uh, and, and, and um Andrew Coombe spoke about it on Club Rugby that they didn't have a defence coach. I think it's crucial to have a defence coach no matter where you are. And for Cardiff to to seal a guy in in Gethin Jenkins who's you know, really is still learning his craft. To be fair, I know he had his stint in Wales coaching, but I you know, maybe that came a bit soon for him. And I think he's admitted such himself. So. Now he's got his chance to really earn his craft and prove a point with Cardiff. And I think he has this season. I think the defence has been much better I, I, than it has been in previous seasons. And I think it has been um, a strong point of why Cardiff are generally in games. Um, and, and I don't think it can be faulted that much. So it's a good signing. And obviously as well, you know, you've got that element of a, a player who's come through the ranks, who's played, played for Ponty, obviously played for Cardiff then. And um, then then has gone on to coach the, the regional side as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, he also had a short uh, sojourn with uh, with uh, Wales, but we, we won't talk about that. Although, actually, actually I would no, argue no. he did make Wales' defence quite good in that period. Yeah. It was an improvement on the previous one. Yes. Is, is what I'll say without trying to pick on anyone. Yeah, I, I, I it was a difficult time to be a coach, I think, in Wales, at that in, in a Wales setup at that time, is what I will say. Um, and I think, um, yeah, like you say, like you say, it's, 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 you don't want to dig anyone out particularly. But I think, following on from the successes of Gatland and Sean Edwards, it was going to be difficult for whoever came in afterwards, especially as the defence coach, um, because of the situation with how Sean Edwards wasn't continued. So, yeah, you've got what happened with Al Ed Williams, obviously, and then you've got uh, Gethin following on from that. And um, yeah, look, it's it's. It's good to see him still in in the game in Wales is is one of the major things I will say and and continuing to 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 hone his craft. Yeah, absolutely, and um, you know maybe uh Gatland will stop moaning about uh regions only spending money on players and not the coaching staff. Yes, which will bring me on to just as I said that I don't want to go too much on it, but obviously Sherat had a response to say about the uh. Uh, about about Gatlin's comments last week about the regions not being professional enough and spending money on the wrong places, to which he said, "Well, we're already basically doing that anyway, and you know that's what we've both highlighted on the pod before and various other pod said. You know, we know we haven't got any money, but if we want to get the top S and C coaches in and the top defensive coaches in, you still need some money to pay them. You know, and yeah. on the on the wrap this week, I said, well, you know, Gatlin and his team could always help." Like, you know, imagine if Mike Forshaw went and helped the Dragons out for a day or so a week. Then all of a sudden you've got a, you've got a team now that's playing, you know, getting used to a defensive system ready for the national side and they help set up. I mean, that's why Leinster work the Lens Leinster makes up the core of the Ireland team is because they can basically take these systems and they tweak them for the international game. But then they're there. You know, and they're doing it week in, week out, not just for like Eight, you know, an eight week block and then nothing for two months and then a four week block. And then, you know, it's, you know, uh, I said, because I don't know if you remember the time when um, Sean Edwards came and helped out at Cardiff yeah, defence. Yeah. And I think that was the year we ended up winning the Challenge Cup. And a lot of it was down to our defence. Yeah. I, look, I, I, the back and forth to me, you know, Booth's had to say as well, to so Booth's had to say from the Ospreys' perspective this week as well. I, it just it is frustrating, isn't it? That this I thought infighting between the regions and the U and the WIU was twenty twenty three, and it, we we left that in the past. And twenty twenty four was meant to be the new year, the new reset, and less of that. I, I you know I think the majority of people, including Booth and Shara, are of the opinion that maybe those comments were. Um, at best misguided, and at worst. Um, an unnecessary target at the regions. 
Um, I think Booth said that it wasn't necessarily targeted to the regions, but it didn't come across well. Was basically his summation. I think that's that's a fair fair thing to say. I just I I yeah I to me to me there's no need for those comments really. Um, I think Cardiff Rugby Life have made a really good piece on it, wasn't there? Talking about um, talking about Gatlin's comments. That's really worth a read um, and, and understanding. Or trying to understand what's what what the reasonings behind it from a Gatlin's perspective, and you know, um, it's it's a coach that's you know Gatlin's under pressure now. Maybe maybe he's starting to throw a few spikes in the fire, um, but I don't think he needs to. I think he just needs to keep everyone sweet for the time being. Because let's be honest, uh, Cardiff have done a brilliant job bringing so many of these youngsters through that have shone so brilliantly over the last few weekends, especially um, Cam Winnett on Saturday. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing I did comment on is that both both Sherat and Booth, to a certain extent, sort of said this is how you deal with media, and you know, you know, actually, you know, if if we want to try and have a united, uh, you know, what Wales, and you know, you're gonna get you're gonna get it a lot better with the diplomacy than blaming one of the other parts of the parts of the uh, machine. So, hundred percent. Anyway, so. The, is it your your choice? We can either talk about the Premiership game coming up, or we can review Wales. What would you rather do right now? The Ponty are playing tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Pontypri host uh, Newport tomorrow. I'll start. We'll start with that because that's that's more exciting news to talk about, really. I think. Um, and it's a big game for Pontypri. Uh, they are seventh in the table currently. They're eleven points off Cardiff, who are in fourth. Um, and we saw with Merth uh, a couple of weeks back against um, uh, against Newport that Newport ground out that win and performed really well, especially in the second half uh, against Merth. And it's going to be a tough task for Ponty. Um, Newport are on a massive roll now. They're second in the table. They're rising continuously, two games in hand on Llandovery and. 15 points behind. So, um, look, Newport are pretty much guaranteed a top four space. But if Ponty want to get there, it's not a must-win game uh, mathematically. Um, like I say, some six games left in the season. But I think, realistically, they need a win. Um, and, yeah, hopefully there can be a big crowd up there for, at Southest Road uh, tomorrow night. Um, it'd be on SBC as well and on the social media channels so if you want to watch it there feel free because it's, it's going to be one hell of a game and uh, hopefully it goes well yeah, absolutely yeah, I said, yeah. good luck to actually good, good luck to Ponty not too much luck because I don't want them to knock the rags out of the top four I'm just realised I, mean, I'm just realized I may have over promised I'm not 100% sure it is on SBC I've said it's on SBC and now I'm starting well, to it might be on the S. If, if it's not on S Fossey directly, it's you, they usually host it on their YouTube channel. Yes, hopefully, hopefully it's on the YouTube channel. Um, I will double check that and I'll uh, post something if it is or not, uh, tomorrow morning, right? And then, so shall we just get get it out of the way because we can just talk about it, breeze through the Cardiff players, and then, and then get on to the real, the real, the real painful chat. So, yep. obviously, we lost on the weekend, we played Ireland. And our top try, and you know, and you know, it was a great try for Pen P try. Um, so 30, 31 7 down. I mean, 24 point loss, you know, that was basically what we were saying was going to happen. But do you think, you know, it, both coaches saying that it didn't reflect the game properly? One thing it should be much closer, the other one thought it should be much more of a, a, a blowout. Which do you think either of them are right or? Uh... I, I got both points. I, th I thought Fad Farrell's comments maybe um, I personally found them a little bit unnecessary. They sort of were a cocky, arrogant, slightly unnecessarily pointed response of sort of, oh no, we should have beaten them by more. You know, we could have won by more, and it sounded a bit. I, I got to be honest, it didn't come across well to me. But um, maybe that was in the clouds of frustration rather than anything else. Um, Look, first half, Wales were utterly dominated. Let's be frank about it. I, Ireland, Ireland had, you know, so much territory, so much possession. The only surprise was that Wales were only, what was it, twenty points down at half time, and or 17, 17, 20 points down at half time, and it wasn't more. Um, 
there were some brilliant bits of play in that. You know, you talk about your Tommy Raphael's getting brilliant turnovers. You've got um, moments of brilliant defence as well. I thought defensively, some players really did step up. I thought George North was superb in defence. I thought um, Alex Mann, particularly in his first first half, was brilliant defensively, making a number of tackles. You've also got your likes of Gareth Thomas doing his normal shift of just tackle after tackle, fair play to the guys for a looser prop, he does tackle a hell of a hell of a lot um, defensively um, but then second half I thought that, I thought there were a lot more positives to be honest um, you know the, the attacking play thanks to um, Carl Dixon for spotting something as a referee as opposed to the other two so that um, they saw the uh, um, uh, offside from Tyke Byrne or, or coming around the side, swimming up the side of the mall and I called that as a penalty try, which it was. Um, you've then then also got a few more frustrations in the second half, which are not clinical enough and not taking opportunities because there should have been two more tries, I thought, at least from Wales in that um, second half. Um, but it's a tough one, really, because the prediction matches up with the results, but the performance was slightly better than I predicted. Um, and I think it was just a side that was beaten because Ireland are a better side rather than it wasn't a blowout, but it was just Ireland are a better side right now. And that's that. Uh, you know, that's, that's to be honest, how I took it, along with a couple of things in the first half where I thought um, there was a bit of, uh, I don't want to s- smash referees, but I thought it was a very typical URC refereeing performance, if that makes any sense, where it was very pro one side for one half and then sort of tried to even it out in the second half. And, yeah, scrummaging-wise, yeah, oh, well, Port again away with his 45-degree angles as per, you know. But, um, yeah, yeah, Ireland are a better side right now. That's that's just that. And and I was always prepared to say that and and just pump it down as, there we go, that was that game. But I thought the performance-wise and the heart of the players, you cannot fault at all. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do think there are a couple of issues, and it's going to sound familiar to regular listeners of the podcast. But there's some there were some key moment decisions that I think we should have really, you know, I think a more experienced side would have gone. So like when we were seven nil down, penalty run from the coast, we go we go for the we go for the corner, lose the line out because Toby Raffle goes in, and actually at seven nil down, I'd have taken the three mm. again. And then there was another one when we we're seventeen seven. You know, Tyburn, you know, Tyburn's about to come back on. We've just had a massively long bit of balling play. Everyone's a bit knackered. And, you know, they turn them all, you know. I, I get it because, you know, we just scored it. We haven't long scored a penalty try for the ball. But like, Tyburn's about to come back on. He's one of the best defensive line-out jumpers there are. Why not just, again, just take pick because 17-10 is, you know, that puts you within the score and that's where you can go. I get that, you know, and I do get it's a trend in rugby now to, to ignore the points and try and go for tries, tries, tries. But when, you know, we've had three halves, you know, we've now had three halves of rugby where we've not scored a point. Maybe it's time to accept our attack isn't anywhere near where we want it to be. So let's just take cheap points when they're on offer. Mm-hmm. You know, and, you, know it's, it's, you know, it's a complaint I've had with Italy for ages as well. We need to you know, except, you know, if you think back to the 2019 World Cup, we built a game plan around the fact that, you know, if we can't score off first or second phase, we're probably not going to score. So we started pinging drop goals left, right? Pinging drop goals. You know, that's, I feel like we need to have that little bit of smart sense because the attack's going to come eventually. I mean, if you remember Ireland in 2020, their attack was woeful. It was shocking. But they stuck with it. But at the same time, they relied on the things they were good at. You know, they're just constant long phase possession, good, brilliant kicking, you know, Sexton kicking everything. So, yeah, it was a bit naive. Um, yeah, shout out, as always, for Cam Winnett. I mean, so some of his stats now. Made four passes, 13 runs for 106 metres. I know a lot of them are cheap for being a fullback. Um, <clears throat> but he made Wales' only clean break, beat four, in the same time beat four defenders and had an offload. You know, that four defenders beat him was... Basically, the same as was almost as <laughs> many as 
George North, Wayne Knight, and the rest of the pack combined, mainly because the pack, most other than Wayne Knight, the pack didn't beat any defenders. Um, Rio Dye is the only one who had more with six. It's, you know, I thought, well, I thought Azarati will have learned a lot from having to deal with Porter. I do mm-hmm. think, you know, he's still quite young in propping terms, so he's, you know, a bit naive. I also think, I also raised the point that I think it might have to do with the way Humphreys coaches a scrum. Because if you listen to a lot of the messages he's had since he since he joined Team Wales, it's all about being, I want it to be a pushing contest. I want it to be about everyone pushing straight. And it seems like he's telling the props not to try and get away with things. And I do think that's incredibly naive because same as the breakdown, if you can get away with it, you get away with it. Like I think it was absolutely like fantastic bit of captaincy for Peter Omani to just sort of be there physically holding up Andrew Porter's elbow in scrums. Because it's like, well, if, if he's not, if Piani's not looking at it, he's not going to ping it. And the texture zone will never come in for those sorts of things. So, wow. yeah. You know, and yes, that's and yes, that's probably not. You know, I'm a hundred percent sure that's not legal. Some of the stuff I didn't do the breakdown was not legal. I did find one thing I did find weird, and I'm quite glad Dave Jenkins actually came out, and it's probably the first time I've heard him over the ref mic. He was just like, "Can you ref both teams the same, please?" And you know, that was just, and that seemed to put thought in the head because we were getting pinged left, right, and centre for sealing off. Oh. and you'd see Irish play, and Irish players do it all the time because they get away with it. I mean, Squidge put a tweet out saying that. Every team does it because it's only penalised one in every 90 rucks. It's just that we seem to be five of the 90, you know, for, for Wales. But um, And then this, this, this crooked feed in the scrum, and then the next scrum is <laughs> an even more egregious feed. It's one of those things, and it does make me feel for Osprey Sands, because they have, they seem to get always get PRD, and he always refs like that. I don't know what, what happened to him as a schoolboy on holiday in Wales one year. But it's clearly stuck with him. Same way as Car- Andrew Brace hates Cardiff, despite because he lived there. I don't know who's. These are all, of course, cool. me taking the mick and J- <laughs> yeah. just opinions. I'm not saying these as facts before anyone comes to Sam. But I just, I, I, I thought, um, uh, I, I didn't want to get into ref chat because I wanted to keep my words. But I, I'll say, I'll say, I didn't think it was the best refereeing performance I've ever seen in my life. That's me being as mild as I possibly can about it, um, because I, it, it was pinged to death. And at some moments, um, yeah, the ceiling off, the ceiling off frustrated me because it seems like if it's a first phase attack off of, of and it's a ceiling off, then it's it's pinged. But if it's just around the corner carries, it's fine. And it's just like okay, well, which which is the consistency approach and. Um, yeah, there, there were a few things that that I was frustrated with. The, the scrum was one, the, the the other things. But from if we look at it, I'm, and I'm trying my best as a positive angle. Um, I know I need to eat a bit of humble pie about the whole can win it situation. So I think earlier this season I said, well, I think Beetham's more of a Gatlin fifteen, and can win it's more of a creative fifteen because can win it can do it all. He's, yeah. he's shown that he is as solid as they come. Defence field tackle as well as they as, as well as anyone. He's good under the high ball, becoming better every game I see him. He wants the counter-attack at every opportunity and, let's be honest, is a threat in the counter-attack and prepared to carry against big forwards, even if he's not the biggest. I thought he was brilliant on the weekend. I thought, to be honest, I thought it was the... Um, Best fullback performance of, of the round, and Frawley wasn't bad at all. Frawley was, you know, for a guy playing out of position, he wasn't bad at all. But um, I thought uh, in, a, in, a, in a losing cause, Winnet was brilliant, and that's not just saying because he's Cardiff, he was brilliant. And as far as take, you know, duck taking to walk to blink and out, like if, if that's his what was it, third cap, where, where's he going to be when he gets the 30 gap? So, so excited. What was it? Yeah, it was his third cap, and is what I think he's only just about hit double digits of pro pro games in total. Mad, mad. Um, yeah, I mean, again, I'm, I don't want to go on to these things, but I can't believe Hans Capuazzo was given, uh, you know, was put in so many people's team fifth at fifteen for so many people's team, which is like, do, do you watch? Do you look? Because yeah, he but... actually, other than scoring that wonder try, that wonderful try. He did fuck off. Yeah, but he actively made the job harder for Italy. 
And I know that's sacrilege because I love I love I love Cap Watson, but yeah. Ken Winner is a definitely a better fullback. I think I mean I think I don't know if you you necessarily agree, but I'd say he's won the fullback battle. All three games for me, I'd say overall he's played better. I know Freddie Stewart was great with the high ball and stuff, but did he re- you know did he really do much else other than that? I, I and I think he was better than Carl Rowe in, in the Scotland game. He's a better fullback than Carl Rowe, but he, he, I'd give it I'd give it to Freddie because he just catches every blinker thing, and I still don't know why. Yeah, he's but then it's, well, no, he dropped one ball. Can win it? Didn't? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if, if that's your metric for a fullback. But he did catch one over Cam, so there's 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 that flip side of it, I suppose, as well. Yeah, no, but like he's like a million miles tall. I mean, like <laughs> that's going to happen, and he's still. Def- and, you I, know, I Cam win it. Can, you know, Cam win it doesn't look like he's running through treacle constantly, and they can get yeah. dropped for George Furbank. Oh, I don't understand that, but anyway. Well, but... you seem to play all right, I guess. Well, anyway, I think I think that's the uh, game put to bed. Anything else you want to talk about from Six Nations, or we? I, can I just talk, I, I, because you mentioned Cap Watson, can I just talk about Menoncello's performance for two seconds? Because Blinken Ellie was superb. Yeah. Sorry, true. but what a performance. Uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah. Probably the only, probably one of the few backs in the Italy squad at the moment I'm currently fearing when, when we come to play because I'm playing thinking, well, whether oh. he comes up on the wing or at 12, I'm not sure how we're going to, how we're going to contain him. He's quick. He carries like an absolute ox like he the, the carry he does where he disposes of two or three defenders and then gets eventually dragged down by Boudouin is brilliant he's then smashing players oh what a performance sorry I to be honest I thought it was one of the performances of the weekend if not the performance I know there was a winger in a certain Scotland game that was pretty good but I thought he was absolutely brilliant in each other I, if you know, I'd, okay, maybe I was about to say maybe I'd take that over a one to try any day of the week, but maybe, maybe I'm being a little bit too, using too much hyper, hyperbole there. But um, yeah, I thought he was absolutely superb. And yeah, as you mentioned, when it comes to a couple of weeks' time, whether he's playing at twelve with Brax at thirteen, or whether he's on the wing with Cap as his is fifteen, it's, he's going to be brilliant. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm with you on that one. Uh, I said yeah, and then. One thing I would say is the Italy game is I'm, I'm not going to go into the penalty set, but I do think again Italy, we, Italy and France both showed they are very much beatable for Wales. Oh yeah, I I generally think, and especially with um some of the players France are going to be you know some even more players France are going to be missing in two weeks time. Yeah, yeah, and and then you add into I don't know what Italy were doing in the first half, but not clearing your lines for forty minutes is 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 an odd tactic. And then even more odd is France not capitalising on it for 40 minutes. So I don't know what was going on in that game. Absolutely bizarre. But anyway, well, I, I, I could speak about that game for about two hours. So we better head back to, to the realms of Cardiff. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, before we start thinking about uh, the likes of France and Italy, uh, we, the Blue and Blacks are playing the, the other capital blues in the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the competition. Well, I suppose the ball, Blue Bulls also were. The balls yeah, also were. They all they also play in one of South Africa's capitals, but I was also going to ask you, what do you say about Edinburgh? Is that a blue kit? Is it a navy blue kit? I suppose, yeah. Well, all the yeah. capital teams are in some sort of blue. Thing is, for me, <laughs> Edinburgh stands up because it's the fluorescent orange. Yeah, because they, they 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 just went. <laughs> Let's lean into a stereotype. We're going to dress like I am, bro. And fair fucks so I think it's great. <laughs> I just hope uh, Craig isn't uh, too offended by that one. <laughs> <laughs> Our friend of the pod. Um, anyway, yeah, so we're playing we're playing Leinster, so top of the table as as per because you know it's it's not first place, it's Leinster place now. Um obviously they're gonna be without most well, I can't imagine they'll get any one back from the Ireland squad. But it's still a pr- pretty devastating team because I don't th- I don't think Cardiff is uh, scheduled to get anyone. We'd have hoped, you know, mo- most people would have hoped for someone like Teddy Williams, who's not really played, but I imagine he's going to be in Dav Jenkins' spot during training this week. Um, you know, Mackenzie Martin seems to be favoured there. seb has got an injury. Um, it's no way we're going to lose any of the props. I said the only one possibly we could get back is Evan Lloyd, but then I imagine, you know, we've got Evan Daniel and Liam Belcher, so that's probably the one position we don't really need uh, any reinforcement for, for this week. 
So what what are your immediate thoughts on it? Yeah, I immediate thoughts haven't really changed from a couple of weeks ago where I said there aren't, you know, bar South Africa, there aren't many worse sides to face in this window than Connacht and Leinster because Connacht obviously don't lose many players and Leinster is just so stacked that, you know, it doesn't matter who they turn out. You know, you, you lose Van der Fleer, you play Connors at seven, you lose uh, Gibson Park, you've got McGrath who's got all of the experience at nine, you've got one of the Burns will play 10, I'm sure. Um, even uh, I, Or maybe even Prendergast, who I, I genuinely think Prendergast is the next big thing. I, I He looks, watching it for under 20s uh, last season or the year before, he was some special player. So, um, yeah, I, I uh, it, it's going to be a difficult task, regardless of, of, of what side Lens have put up. But at the same time, it's a, it's a task that Cardiff have won, won before and have well, very sweet memories from winning a couple of seasons ago. So why can't they win again? And, you know, the performance against Connacht, there were spells of that game where you saw a, a kind of side that are really dogged and clicking and working well in certain aspects, lying out um, in the second half. And then Scrum was really strong towards the end of the game as well. So why... Why can't it be a Cardiff side that knocks over Leinster and gets that win that, let's be honest about it, has been coming for a bit of time now? Um, I'm trying to think of the last time Cardiff won a game, which it has been a bit of a... Has been a bit, hasn't uh, it? Well, you haven't won this year, so the last win was Boxing Day against the Dragons, which, to be fair, you can just put, you can just basically take that as a given these days. <laughs> I'm sure our colleagues on the Dragons layer would, uh, would hate us, both hate us and laugh because they... they because it's actually just getting to be a bit of a joke now. Yeah, yeah I, I, absolutely. I think we, and I think we've probably got. It depends. On, like, uh, hopefully they'll learn. Hopefully, some of the issues we had in the Connacht game was just the fact they haven't played. And a lot of those players haven't played. Some of yeah. them all seasons, others in four. You know, in like four or five weeks. You know, they've only been a two week gap, gap this week. They had a live training session against the Dragons because that's how few players we have. But you know, hopefully, if they've made it at least the close to game intensity, that should that should have given them something. Do we want to talk roughly what we think the teams can be? Obviously, with a few injuries, some big players out. I can't yeah. imagine there being too many changes, but no, I, I can't. I can't imagine too many changes. Go, uh, uh, go for it. Um, do you want to look back three? Will probably be relatively the same. I'd expect, isn't it? Yeah. So we're thinking, um, beat them at would... fifteen. Yeah, and then Lane and somehow. Yeah, um, unless unless they go with Lane at thirteen, um, but I suspect the more obvious option there is to either move Halla Hollow across or bring Millard into thirteen. Um, obviously, you've spoken about your not issues; issues is too strong a word, but your feelings on perhaps Halla Hollow not being the best option at thirteen. What 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 would you what route would you go down there? Problem is, is I think he's not. He, he clearly hasn't been fit last few games. I'm not saying he isn't fit now, but I do think he's a little bit. He was a little bit off the pace of the thirteen mm. when we've put him in here in the past. The problem is, is you've got Lane, who I know sort of filled in quite am am amicably. Um. Uh, you know, during the Connacht game, it wasn't too bad. He still had a few slip ups. And then Millard hasn't played 13 at all this season. You know, he's basically no. primarily a wing. I mean, for me, I'm probably looking at Thomas and Hallaholo because it's a, it's at least a partnership we've used this season. And then you, maybe you look at and I'd keep Lane on the wing. because It's more because I'm just not sure who would... You'd either be bringing Lane in 13 or Millard in 13 and the other one being on the wing. So, I mean, for me, I'd probably go Thomas and Hallaholo. I, I, but I, part of I, me I, also feels like we need to do, we need to experiment with these things because we need a 13 for next season. And I don't know if Lilo's going to stay in another one. I mean, he's 38. It's, I mean, I've already made my feelings clear that I'd quite like to see if the new owners would consider um, giving him a contract coaching in the academy. If that's the sort of thing he wants to do and he's able. Mm, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, 100% be on board with that. But uh, on on the other point, I think I, I'm I'm a big believer that generally there aren't. I don't think there are that many centres that can play both. 
you've got your odd one, like you've got your Owen Watkin who can do a job at both quite successfully. Scott Williams has in the past to different I levels of success. Did it quite well last season, and yeah. kind of has been forced to in Gloucester in bit part role. Yeah, uh, and but there aren't. I don't think there are that. You know, Robbie Henshaw's obviously the the exception to the rule. He's one who has made a career. I of think both him and Bundy have do, both him and Bundy have been doing it for Ireland. Yeah, but Bundy, I don't. I I don't think Bundy's a twelve, and when he plays thirteen, plays thirteen as a almost as a twelve. And, and yeah, is he doesn't. I mean, I suppose it helps. They've got some fantastic defensive players. Exactly. So I, I but personally. I, I just I generally think that you're either a twelve or a thirteen. So I'd like I'd like to see one of the thirteens give a shot. And to be honest, I'd, I'd rather see Lane there than Millard because of how Millard's played on the wing this season. So I think I'd go Lane at thirteen. I know that's so. Who do you have? Who do you have? So would you put Millard in on the wing then? Yeah, I put Millard on the wing with Summerhill and then Lane at thirteen. Um, which is odd for me to say because I, I don't think I've ever suggested Lane at 13 before, but I I just I can see more of a future of him on at 13 than maybe Millard at the moment. Um, then, yeah, Ben Thomas at 12 because he's been brilliant. De Beer at 10, I think that's if he's fit and, and everything's better than uh, that. It seems to be the murmurings are that he is a lot better. Um, and then... Nine, you keep Alice Bevan, didn't you? Because I thought yeah. he played very I, I well. I said, I was going to say, 9, um, 10, 12, probably the easiest in this team to pick. Yeah. And well, and maybe 15. So yeah. do you want to go one, one to eight for a pack then? So, I mean, front row, Carrie Belcher, Will Davis King if Litterick's not fit? Yeah, nor would you move Kira or would you start Parker? Um, and they I went, think, that front row went quite well. Yeah, I think I'd start Will Davis King, yeah. Um, yeah. If 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 Litterick's not fit, I start Will Davis King. If Litterick's fit, I think he comes back in because he has been very good this season. Been very impressed with Litterick. Um consistently good. Um, and that's the thing he did, Kieran Parker. Uh, but uh, purely from um, maybe a development point of view, I'd like to see more of Will Davis King because I think I've seen bits of him. Sometimes he hasn't performed as well as hoped, and sometimes he has performed as well as hoped. So it, it's about getting that consistency with Will Davis King. I think moving forward. Um, you know, he's very young for a tight end. That's the first point to make. So get, give him some game time, give him some runs out on his legs. Um, and then second rows, I expect, well, Turnbull's going to play, isn't he, on his 200th appearance? Yeah. Is it going to be second row or is it going to be six? And are they going to carry on with Shane Lewis Hughes at second row? What are you saying? Because I, I know I'd rather see Turnbull at second row, but I am, but I think Jockey's very keen to give Shane Lewis Hughes as much time at second row as he possibly can this season. Mm. You know, and he's made it, you know, quite clear because when even when we were scrambling, you know, we're scrambling the second scrambling for sixes, and when like the obvious choice would be to move Shane Lewis Hughes out to six, he'd put he brought Tamani in at eight instead of putting him into the second row and things like that. And you know, even said Davis at eight. You know, instead of maybe moving you know, so I wonder who could play six and eight over. So that's that's more where I'm thinking more because I think Sherat's thinking of the future because it's starting to feel like this might be Turnbull's last season. I'm hopefully I'm hopefully I'm, I haven't just retired him early, <laughs> but it, 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 I don't know if you get what I mean. It's that sort of vibe of you know he seems he, seem, he seems to be doing an awful lot less. I know he has been injured the front end of the season, but you know I'm I'm just wondering if they're thinking of. Again, maybe you know him spend a bit more time coaching Newcastle Emlyn, and or you know maybe even again, I get it. Basically, just for anyone who's over about 30, 33, just retire them and give them a, a coaching contract, and then they can always be dual registered then afterwards. But uh, well, that, around a gap. let's be honest with with the situation currently. That is that is what's going to happen, I think, because. A lot of these players, maybe not so much Turnbull, but you look at the situation of the Scarlets, for instance, some of those players that are on the older age age are on bigger contracts than the young guns that are coming through. And perhaps one haven't got the haven't got the length of careers to give. And when we're in budget requirements and budget constraints, I think that is something that's going to happen, that these players are going to be moved on. I yeah, I I personally 
I'd like to see Turnbull play. I don't know if he'll start or he'll be on the bench. I hope for his 200th he starts. But then again, yeah. I, I'm not having, you know, looking back at uh, a certain Wales-Italy game from a few seasons ago. I'm, I'm, I'm less inclined to offer caps just for the sake of it because they deserve it. But um, on, on historical performances. But yeah, he, he deserves to play a part in the 23. Um, you may, I don't see him and Shane Lewis Hughes as a second row combination. That's probably one of the... No, I think, one of, I think Thornton's one them, going to be one of them. Yeah. Um, it, you, you need a line-out operator. And I, I, I think we saw the limit... As, as good as Shane Lewis Hughes is at getting quickly up off the floor, there are limitations to that, as we saw in the first half against Connacht. Um, in terms of his height, he's just not as tall as some others, so he gets caught out on that aspect. So um, I think, yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to see... Um, I, I, I personally would, would start Turnbull on his 200th, I think, but ugh, it's a bit harsh on Shane Lewis Hughes at the same time. Yeah. So I said, for me, I think we're looking at um, Shane Lewis Hughes at loose head lock and then Thornton at five, and then my back there would be Turnbull, Young and Tamani. Yeah. Um, if Delarua was back, I'd pick Delarua. I think he's playing that well. Bruce. I've, I've, I've put him on the bench. Yeah. So I've got him and Ben Donald on my bench because Ben Donald supposedly can, can cover the whole back five. But I don't know if he was hooked off because of an injury, or if it was, I think it was a HRA, wasn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, hopefully he's recovered. If he's recovered, I'll have him back. I, I, I think I'd, 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 I'd... I might have to go 4-4, four, four, or just stick another prop or something on there. I, I just, but Evan Lloyd could obviously cover back row. If he's, if yeah, he's true. Back. I mean, he has a converted eight. Yeah. Um, I, I, I said I'd, it's not the back row I'm worried about cover for, because we could always bring Ellis Jenkins in as well. I, well, so now I don't know how serious his knock is. Yeah, I, I'd start Delarue though. I'm going to say that. I'd start Delarue. I think he's playing that well for his 20s. Um, so that's if, instead of Thomas Young? Or would you have no, him at six? No, at, right? at six. I'd pick him at six. Okay. So, I'm, so I've got Shane Lewis Hughes on the bench. Okay. So I said other other bench up. So, I mean, back again, front row, we're probably looking at Evan Daniel, Reese Barrett and Kieran Parker. Again, this is assuming Luke... Um, Littrick isn't fit. Because if, for me, if Littrick's fit, he starts and Will Davis King goes to the bench for me. Yeah. I said, I've got Ben Donald as my sort of second row-ish cover, more having Turnbull moving in. And then uh, Lucas Delarue was my, my 20 jersey. You're thinking Turnbull. Uh, so you're thinking Shane Lewis Hughes on there for your second row. And then who do you have as your back row cover? Uh, your 20 jersey? Probably Ben Donald, yeah. Yeah, okay. There you go. I think we've I think we've got a consensus on that one. Then back replacements for me, Jamie Hill, Owen Robson, and then if we're going for Owen Lane at thirteen, then I guess Hallaholo in the twenty three. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty simple. I think then um in that back backs division as well, yeah. there, there aren't a horde of options. I think that's fair to say um to choose from. But yeah, those those are those are very solid options to pick. Yeah, I said, and I said the problem is we just don't have. I would, I know, um, Hugh Griffin's uh, screaming at the thing saying, "No, why don't you go six two? Because he loves it. He's loving six two. He also argues that Cardiff should be should be able to do seven one. Problem is we've run out of forwards. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking like players in the senior side now. I do. I can't actually think because they're all either all away from Wales or way where the Wales are injured now. Yeah, I said or, without, um... without putting. I said without putting them. Um, Evan Lloyd on the bench. Yeah, with the exception of us, Lilo, who's, uh, uh, you know, for anyone who isn't aware, is, has a four-week yeah, ban after a, yes. red card. Oh, we missed that news. Lilo's been banned for four matches, one of which includes the Rags game versus Newport. Yeah. Which I have to give shit for, because I gave so much shit for Lozana being picked for a Flanetti game, which is being played the same day as a Scarlet's game, so that's still worse. <laughs> I, I, I honestly, I, I, I think he would have played really well for that Rags game. Um, and uh, it's, can it's, you imagine? Sorry, it is such a stupid situation, though, isn't it? It is. How can you genuinely put that out and think that's fine? If you're, if you're, it should make some mockery of world rugby. 
I, I'm not having a go at Cardiff. Everyone does it. I'm just having a go at the system because it shouldn't be able to be in place, should it? Oh, a- you... absolutely. It's, it's, I, it's I just... a mockery of it. I said, I should say, at least they're all separate weekends. Because the Lozano one, I said it was either the same day or like one game yeah. was a Friday night and the other game was Saturday. And I was like, well, hang on, World Rugby have a two day stand down for playing rugby. I know it never happens at community level, but you know, pro level, it's you know, it should be fairly well re- enforced. Yeah, it's baffling, really. Baffling. Yeah, yeah, absolutely baffling. But can I just say, can you imagine Lilo playing for the Rags against Newport? That yeah. would be proper men against boys shit. Oh, <laughs> like there's great. videos of um, RJ Stamen uh, playing in Japan top one. Yeah. So that's I don't want to I don't want to denigrate on like the rags or the um or Newport or Newport for that, but let's be fair, the man the man's an international who's gone to like two World Cups. It's it would be, it would look silly. Mind you, um Speaking of international, Nico Matawali might be making his long way to come back to Pontypridd on the weekend. So, oh, on to tomorrow night. So, hey, awesome. So, oh, I can't, I'm I'm hoping that happens because I'm looking for some very serious rugby. Is he going to be on the wing or is he going to be at nine? Because him at nine is just hilarious. Who cares? Who cares when Nico Matawali plays? Let's get him on the field. <laughs> I love the idea of him turning up for Pod. I just really love it that he's there. It's it's beautiful, honestly, absolutely beautiful. Yeah. All right. So, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna press you now for a prediction. So, I'll, if it, what's what's your thing there? So, I I said on the wrap, Leinster by twelve. And I feel it. And I'm and then I saw. I don't want to go into ref track again, but I, I saw Mike Addison's the ref, and then I was like. Can I change my prediction, please? To no one should be able, no anyone who protects this game should be burned as a witch because you never know how a game ref by Mike Evans is going to go. So, oh, I, I want to stand up for Mike Evanson, right? But I don't. So there's two elements. There's the Nick Tompkins scenario against Australia where I thought he made the right call. Okay. You know, the knock on that went backwards and he called it. And everyone ripped into him for that. And I agreed that it went back. I thought it went backwards. I thought it was the right call on the bench. And a couple of weeks later, he just did something else. I was like, oh, Mike, you don't help yourself because that wasn't a great call either. And it's like, but, um, oh, this game, uh, Leinster by five. Gonna be inside yeah. seven. Let's be honest um, about it. Let's be fair. I think most people predicting Leinster by five is an incredibly positive result. So it's it's going to be within seven either way. So you know you, you take don't. a punt. Just if you're putting a bet on, say put a forty margin on it somewhere either way, and you're sorted. It's it. I just um. I I. I don't say I'm not saying I fancy Cardiff, but I, I do I do see how they could make an upset. I do see there's a team there that despite not having so many internationals, despite having a few injuries on top of the lack of internationals and suspensions, it's it's a team that makes sense on paper and has 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 played together, has experience of being together. Um and Let's be honest about it. In a, a few of those positions, especially, our players are in form. Ben Thomas in form. Thomas Young in form. Belcher in form. So it's it's not it's not players that are Harry in form. Yeah, Harry, he's carry in form. When everyone's been bemoaning Wales about ball carriers and uh, and a and a twelve who can take who can track it up, and you're just looking at Carry and Ben Thomas like, yeah, all right. Yeah, it just. Oh just... no, was it? They said they wanted a twelve who can who can crash it up and also has a kicking game. Yeah, Carrie can do that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I love Sue's carry at 12. <laughs> I was, I was obviously referring to Ben Thomas for anyone who was didn't get in on humor there, but yeah. no, well, if you yeah, there was a there was a few um interesting punditry decisions over the last few days on there. Stuart Barnes yes, saying yes. Ben Hill should be playing 12 as well for England. Um He's obsessed with that. I don't know if you've ever listened to the Rep podcast, but whenever he's on there, he's always like, Ben Earl should play 12. It's like, all right, granddad. Yes. It's it's that. I, it's, to be honest, 
I'm not as against that as I was Chesham at six. I don't know why I put Chesham at six. The thing is, Chesham at six for me makes more sense because they're trying to make a new Courtney Laws. I I find Chesham at six makes far more sense than George Martin at six. For the same reason, I think Teddy Williams isn't a very good six. They're not that actually all that mobile. They're very good tight headlocks. And you should just let them become the best tight head locks they can be. Chesham's a brilliant second of leaving there. Just just don't touch him. T- leave that combination of Marrow and Chesham. Just leave it. I'm sorry, what's, what's this an argument about a second row shouldn't be played on the blind side? I, 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 I don't have, have an issue with before. most. I don't have an issue with most. It's this particular one. I you know, I, I don't want to stand there for English players. Those two are a particularly good combination. Leave them be. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, Joe Hawkins or Hill or whoever, Reese Carey or who else was I thinking would be a good twelve the other day? I, I I decided I started going through a team of like players playing out of position, and I got in my head that Elliot D would make a bang in scrum up, just because he's got the faster clerk spin. Before every scrum, you'd just be doing it, and you'd just be like, ah, oh. wrong. We all know if we're going to pick someone in the pack to play scrum half, it's Ellis Jenkins. Having done it in a European Cup semi final. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, for the record, um, as I said, I know there's been a bit of chat in the rap chat about potentially moving George North into 12, which actually I think could be interesting. But more yeah. to be honest, I think I think George North needs to come in more. To, going back to the Wales chat now, I'm so sorry. But I think George North coming in on first, first or second phase and that 12 channel. Because if you looked a lot of the time when we were trying to use George North, we were clearly going to use George North as crashing. But it has to go through Tompkins' hands because they're standing 12-13. And Ireland worked this out, so they rush up on the outside of Tompkins, so he's got to be the one who crashes up. And funny enough, as much like Nick Tompkins, he's a lot easier to tackle than George North. I I just don't understand why they haven't told him just do what Manitou Elani does and come on a sharp angle at, from 13 to in. That was, that was, it was so, you know, it was so successful for Manu. And okay, is anyone as physically imposing as Manu? Perhaps not, but George is as pretty well, close as he can get. Um, pretty handy. Yeah, yeah, well. Although a lot slower. And and about half as many lungs. But the, 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 the I just don't understand why you don't do that. A George Sharp angle from 13 on, on, Running at your fly half slash 10, 9, 10, 7 off the back of a line out. Um, defensive yeah, structure. That's it, yeah. Tail gunner structure. That's that's exactly where you want him. He's got pace, he's got power. He's you need to get more than just an arm on him to tackle him. So good luck. You know, I, I, we've seen it. We, he's done it weirdly, he's done it more when he was a winger than he does it as a center. I just don't quite get that. But anyway, I especially when it was all about getting his hands on the ball more. Yeah, he, he, I, I've I, it's it's because George as a as a ball carrying threat, this Six Nation has been brilliant when he's had the ball. He just hasn't had the ball enough, and that's why people are then saying twelve. But I think we the, the the flip side of that I would say is I thought George defensively on the weekend was superb in the thirteen channel. I thought he was brilliant. Um, and, Don't let Lee hear you say that. You'll start going on another rant. Yeah, I know he would, but. I thought there were a lot of okay, maybe you could maybe argue that he was making a lot more last ditch tackles than he should have been, but he was making them and he consistently made them. So I don't know. I I, I personally would leave him at thirteen, um, but yeah. give him the ball more. Yeah, I mean, let's be fair. The whole idea of him being moved from wing to thirteen was giving the ball more. If anything, it seems to have happened less. Yeah, yeah because you know it's about how you set up your attacking structure and certain players to come in. Like yeah. It's very rare you see a team which are actually 10, you know, 10, 12, 13. Yeah. You know, the, you know if you look at like the Hugh Pilotto triangle, you know, it's always slight variation you move through because, you know, you want to try and get your 10 out, 10 out further. But anyway, but, again. Sorry, the, the other thing to mention, obviously, is with France next week, you know, they're probably going to play Ramos at 10, who is sometimes fallible defensively, as great a player as he is. You're probably going to have Mofana at twelve, who is a you know he's a good twelve, but he's not as defensively solid as a Dante. 
So you want him tackling. You want him running into that chap, surely. Absolutely, yeah. So, yeah, anyway. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. It's going to be a... Oh, I, I, one other we, point. We might... I'm, one other point of the Six Nations, sorry. Dante's red is a red. I've seen people talking about it as not being... I wasn't it, going to mention it. That's how that's much of a red of... I've not seen anyone question that, to be honest. So I have. I, in fairness, I think it was a New Zealand fan, and I think it was harking back to the World Cup final and Khaleesi, but it was definitely a red. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> right, so, I said, I think we've covered pretty much everything. Um, so, we're playing Leinster at 7.35pm on Saturday. Uh, so, it's... We're currently do so can't well we're not, not we but Cardiff are currently doing a uh, huge promotion so student prices so I think you buy a ticket it's a reduced ticket and a drink and a free drink on entry I think it's a great idea it's an obvious idea Saturday night get get people into town yeah and you know the point that's make the hue is it's, it's great that they're trying to market different things you know so when it's like an afternoon game it, it's more family and then for the evening games are going for the more sort of the strength and you know people going out. Because I said you're not going to have the same. Like if you sell, if you're going to try and sell out cap for all the variety of games we've got, there are two things we can do: we can either moan constantly about the time all the games are, or we can try and cater each game to different markets, and then the diehards will come regardless. Hmm. Thoughts? Yeah, no, it's spot on. You know, it's 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 just it's good to find different ways to market, and I think the marketing from um, the team has been brilliant this season. Whether it be marketing the team, whether it be marketing the games, you know, the, the Harlequins and Bath games in particular come to mind of how well that was marketed, how well, how well the team, uh, how well they've kept a positive atmosphere around the team. I really like that they've got so much content coming out with, um, you know, whether it be re-signings, whether it be the content of videos of. Matt Sherratt, you know, you compare that to Scarlett, you very rarely see video content of Dwayne Peel, you very rarely see video content of Di Flanagan on this on the socials compared to Cardiff, and it's really good to see. Um, I think they've done a really great job this season. Yeah, absolutely. And was it? I think someone was saying that it's um, I was talk. I think at the CF10 Q and A with um, David Allen, who I'll get onto in a second. Um, he was. You know, they're saying like they've got one person who's doing it part time. And I was listening to the Scarlet Zebra pod, and they're saying that apparently they've got three people doing their social media stuff and they want, and that's only half capacity. I'm going to leave that one there. I, I, I will refrain from commenting. Um, I don't know necessarily. I, I, I do know the team at Cardiff and um, they've been doing a really good job. So I think Cardiff have been doing a fantastic job, but yeah, from what I've heard, apparently it's not. I said, they're, uh, they're saying that you know it's not it's not as full time as they would like it to be, and they're still doing a hell of a job. So yeah, you, you know and the, and the media team are doing well, and Dav Lewis and Mike. Um, yeah, fair play to them. I mean, the one thing I would do, I do like the jockey um, post match clips and stuff like that. I would quite like the full one with the questions because sometimes it, you've got to try and guess what the question was if they don't write it up on the subtitles. I, that's a that's a niggly me thing. I'm not going to moan because I still think any content is better than no content. Yeah, I I can easily explain that one, and that is that the questions will have not have been asked by a member of, of Cardiff's staff. So therefore, that's why you have questions removed. They will be asked generally by probably Johan Dyer. To be fair to him, and shout out to Johan Dyer for turning to up to every single. Welsh regional game, but also maybe a BBC or a Simon Thomas will be there, and maybe that's why the questions haven't been included. I mean, even if it was just what the question was, like, just make sure it's always on there on the bottom. That would just be helpful because sometimes it, because obviously they if, to try and fit into a Twitter video, it, they've condensed it quite a bit. So sometimes it feels like, you know, it's almost like you can see the cut, and then it's like he's, you know, mad and gone off on random topic, you know. Yeah, as if I'm I'm doing the preface conference or something. But I said, I oh, yeah, I can't fault the content. And I love the way they're trying to keep keep filling up filling up the thing. I mean, I've got a feeling this isn't going to be a sellout. No, but to say that, but they, I mean, I did see the the their Twitter accounts back down someone who was moaning 
I say, well, don't you ask, you know, because I think Rugby Inside Line said, oh, you know, Premiership clubs, you should be trying these these for, like, when you've got hard to fill fixtures. Mm. And you sort of said, well, you know, ask them how many times they've used, you know, they've worked, you know, to get, what, maybe 10, 10 15 tickets? And the guy went, and then they kind of point, you know, this is still quite early on in the week, went, well, we're already mid-triple figures. <laughs> so, I mean, it works. Mm. You'd be amazed. You'd be amazed what you'll do as a student for for a free drink. No matter how much you pay, if it's a free drink, you'll do it. Yeah, let's not go down that rabbit hole. I feel that could be a very different podcast. <laughs> that, that's that's a whole different Twitter poll. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, I think we've covered pretty much everything today. I would. I would, uh, I would be, I would push us ahead to, you know, allow the Ospreys to start recording. But by their own admission, they are a shambles of a podcast at the moment. That is James's words, not mine. Basically, because they said they start rambling about good players and stuff for half an hour because during the Wales week, they're just not really bothered. But to be fair, hilarious listening. So I said last week's one on, um, well, was it the Rainbow Cup game between Cardiff and Ospreys? And I forgot some of those people, the, some of the people on the Cardiff team even played for us. That's how <laughs> shambolic a team it was. I think it was, the, it was speak, because it's quite to pertinent to that, I think it was the first game of, um, it was the first game we had at Owen Lane at 13. Here we go. That's a nice little, uh, that's a, that's a nice little, yeah. It's a weird, weird squiggly circle. It's like a comedic show. Al Murray would be proud of that. Anyway, so um, once again, please remember to like, subscribe, give a comment. Thank you very much for Tony for um, giving it, giving us um, some feedback on the on the on the Twitters. Uh, I won't go into what 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 was said because I don't know if he was particularly happy with, whether or not he'd be happy with us posting it publicly or not. So uh, we'll just say leave it at thank you very much. It it is appreciated. We do take take it on board, and um, yeah, please give, drop us a like, subscribe. Uh, so thank you, Kerwin. Come on, thank you. Uh, thank you for listening. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to the Cardiff Central podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to us, as it really helps spread the word. You can find us on all the usual social media channels, or email us on Welsh Regional Rugby Pod at gmail.com. And remember, whatever the question is. Rugby is always the answer. Sports Social Podcast Network.